So let's get started. Um, hi, everybody, and welcome to our session. I hope you had a nice second uh, day here at the Berlin Summit. And as you probably have seen by the amount of sessions um, around data on our agenda, I think it's fair to say that data is a really important asset uh, in our world. And our customers ask us a lot, um, what is the best possible way to start building a data platform? Or if some other customers already have a data platform, they also often reach out to us and ask, okay, what's a good way to scale an existing data platform maybe from one domain into many, many domains in, in their company. Yeah, and quite often those discussions start um, super technically. So we discuss uh, things like architecture and frameworks. But in order to build um, a, a successful and long-lasting platform, or specifically a data platform, there are other forces that need to come into play. And this is what we want to look at today in our session. I'm Stefan Kliche. I'm a senior solutions architect from AWS. I'm working in a financial services team here out of Berlin. And John and myself, uh, we're part of a group that is called um, Data Strategy Advisory. And what we do is we help customers to formulate and realize impactful data strategies. John. And I'm John. Um, I'm in the solution architect. I used to work with enterprise customers then moved to digital native businesses. So I tried to combine the experiences I learned from both worlds. And as Stefan mentioned, I'm also part of the same group of Data Strategy Advisory. What we are going to talk about today, and this is the most important takeaway that I would like you to take, is that we're going to talk about mental models to describe your data strategy journey. How can you think about your data platform in order to scale it across the organization. You don't really have to focus a lot on the service names. The most important thing is that you get this mental model. When we talk about data strategy, the first thing that comes to mind is the data platform. But in fact, what we really mean by data strategy are those three pillars. The mindset which talks about how you can make your organization successful with data. And an important part of it is the use cases that's going to make your organization differentiate itself. The second part is people and process. This boils down to the stakeholders that are going to use data across the board. Finally, technology will be focusing on providing them the tools that's going to enable them day to day, rather than working against them. Right? OK. So the first thing is mindset. And I'm going to start to sound less like a yoga instructor. But when we talk about mindset, it has been some time since this article came out that was describing data as a new strategic asset for organizations. And it was comparing data to the new oil. But Time and time again, when you start to ask customers today, would you rather discover oil under your organization headquarters or have more data about your customers and your services, which one do you think customers would pick up? Raise your hand if you think people would pick up oil. Yeah, it's, it's, it's easy to use oil. It's easy to monetize oil. But it's really hard to monetize data. Data is really valuable when you have the use case for it. And in fact, PwC had a survey around the organizations that have been hiring chief data officers. This number is growing year over year, but last year it was 24%. And those uh, chief data officers are given a mandate maybe to build a data-driven culture or a, a data, modern data platform. But in reality, all those mandates are a proxy to monetize our organization's data. And this is not an easy thing to do. Let's look at some of those use cases to see how we can monetize the data. So for example, we have Buzz from business. Buzz is looking at the clickstream data 
uh, to identify which services are uh, famous with customers and which customers are using them often. Let's imagine that in a retail scenario. If Buzz looks at this data alone, it would provide some insights, but they realize if they combine that with backend telemetry or business events coming from backend services, now they can have a differentiating capability by understanding an end-to-end -end customer journey from the point they pick up something to how it was delivered to their home, and maybe if they returned it back. Sandra, from uh, a data scientist, Sandra can look at transactions that are coming in bulk and then understand if there is non-compliant transactions. However, if she combines this with telemetry about when those transactions were done, from where, in which order, or in which bulk, Sandra can build a differentiating use case of a fraud detection. Now, you see a common theme here. Data integration brings value across different domains, and that can be some mindset shift that we want to provide for our organization. In fact, data is important for your generative AI use cases as well, because while a large language model can understand your prompts and give you guidance, if this is not guardrailed by your own data, it can provide irrelevant results or sometimes undesirable results. All right. I think it's now time for a story, and Stefan is a great storyteller. Thank you, John. Um, yeah, exactly. So what we want to do now is uh, we want to switch the perspective um, towards the people. And in our session today, we want to do it um, by looking at a fictional company and, and the fictional story of that company. But maybe this is even a story of, of your company. So let's get started and um, let's meet the team. Um, you already uh, heard uh, John introducing Buzz. So um, Buzz from business is probably the stakeholder that we are most familiar with because um, yeah, Buzz represents those data literate communities that we have in our company. And they are using data and insights generated out of data to drive strategic decisions. So um, Buzz is typically consuming the data in form of dashboards and reports um, delivered by BI tooling. And uh, he needs the, the capability or the ability to navigate very fast within aggregated information and also do things like what-if analysis. The, the query patterns of Buzz can be described as um, planned and also predictable. And then at the other end, uh, we have Jim. And Jim is a data architect or a data engineer. And he is building those data-driven experiences for Buzz from business in form of data platforms, but also other data-driven applications. And he mostly works with data-centric development tools. Yeah, and then last but not least, uh, we meet Sandra. And Sandra is a data scientist. And she represents our organization's outlook into the future um, by incorporating AI and machine learning into predictive insights. And her journey might start in a spreadsheet um, or in a Jupyter notebook, but then later on, she wants to productionize her models. And she needs an, an ML tool chain that exactly allows her to do that. So Sandra doesn't really need aggregated information, but she needs access to integrated data coming from many, many different source systems of our company. Yeah, and so this is how the story begins. So Buzz from Business reaches out to Sandra and asks, hey, um, Sandra, why are our customers not using the newly expressed checkout feature that we launched maybe two or three months ago um, on our website? And as typically for those companies, you know, the conversations are taking place maybe in the cafeteria, Jim overhears that conversation. And he directly jumps in because he has a solution. His team uh, and, and Jim itself have built a strategic data platform. And this data platform is already fueling the BI dashboards that Buzz is already using. So what Jim does is um, granting Sandra and many other builders out there access to the data platform. So far, so good. 
But Sandra needs access to more data sources and more integrated information. So she reaches out to Jim and asks, hey, can you please also add those other data sources? Yeah, and then over time, as the amount of data sources increase, uh, what happens? Well, Jim and his team um, are getting burned out. And if there's one thing that we all should not underestimate here today in our room, it is the power of a spreadsheet in the hands of a data scientist. So what happens is the following. Of course, Sandra and all those other builders out there, they will find their way to access those other source systems. And this will manifest itself in different notebooks and spreadsheets being scattered around in yeah, many servers in our company. Now, this makes Jim sad because now we introduced security issues and also data governance issues. And then as Sandra is working with the data, she figures out um, as other people are working with the data too, they all put a spin on how they interpret the data. So, for example, there might be um, different entities being called the same thing. Or, for example, another team wanted to do a calculation like, uh, and they forgot uh, about important components. They wanted to calculate, for example, um, revenue and then they forgot to yeah, include local tax when they do the calculation. And this makes Sandra sad because the insights she's getting to are not in line with what Buzz is seeing uh, in his dashboards. And then last but not least, also Buzz is sad because the insights he's asking for um, are taking weeks or even months to get to. And then we end up in this typical situation where we question what's the value of data and what is the value of the data platform that we've built over the last years. And we need a good way out of that situation. John, maybe you can help us here. All right, let's try. But uh, first, I would like to tell you that every time we put Jim on fire, I feel sad as well. Sorry for that. Yeah. Technology. This now would boil down to your data platform, right? So if I have a better platform, this problem would all go away. But in fact, it is not just that technology. It's not just a better box that's going to make all the lives of everyone easier. To describe that, we have a mental model that we are going to walk through to know how we can improve our data platform in an evolutionary way. The first thing that we need to look at is removing any adoption barriers. If we have data, let's see how can we make it a lucrative offer for everyone to bring their data to the data platform. Second, we need to provide the best tool for the job for every stakeholder. Because as we have seen, Buzz has different needs from Sandra, and they probably have different needs from all those smart application builders. Third step, and that says third step, not a first step. You now can consider distributed data architectures or patterns like Data Mesh in order to scale this across your organization and taking the agility with you. All right, what does it mean that we remove adoption barriers? If we look at a high-level architecture, we see on the one side, we have Sandra. Sandra would love to discover what is the data that exists out there in our data platform. On the other side, we see Jim. Jim looks at the data sources and figures out he would need to bring the data in either batch, or maybe if he wants to move towards near real time, he wants to bring in data in streaming way. To do that, Jim can use AWS Glue, our integrate data integration service with manage uh, Spark environments to bring the data in batches or integrate the data in general. If he wants to move towards near real time, he can use uh, Kinesis Data Firehose to reliably bring the data into the data platform. Here is one thing. He can also abstract those services and make it easier for people to bring their data. So for example, he can use Apache Airflow to orchestrate different integration jobs and make it a pipeline. And we have a managed service for that. 
or Amazon managed workflows for Apache Airflow. And if he wants also to abstract the way of integrating with different providers that are bringing data into the data platform, he can have an API that would uh, hide the Kinesis data APIs. Although everyone can just use it, he can provide an abstraction layer with different uh, authentication needs for different sources. In between ingesting the data and making it discoverable, he will set up a, a data landing zone. Let's look at what this data landing zone needs to do. First, it needs to understand what the data looks like. Then, it's going to look at specific attributes and provide deep meaning into those attributes of data. After that, it's going to look if it is bringing the right quality of data to the data platform, and then it's going to decide, based on that, which kind of storage is uh, uh, suitable for our data. And throughout all this journey, and this is something that I always forget in rehearsals, don't forget it, throughout all this journey, he's going to audit. He's going to audit what data and who access it, by which tools, and uh, when did they do that, and most importantly, why? And the why can be as simple as someone from a data domain accessing their own data, so that's implicit. Or it can be as simple as a comment saying, I want to have access to this data. When we talk about how we understand the data, AWS Glue has a nice feature, which is a glue crawler. A glue crawler would just look at your data and understand the schema of the data. But it also has some nice feature. Every time it looks at the data, if it finds that there is a schema breaking change, it would create a new version of the schema. Now you can detect those version changes and notify the data owners about schema, schema breaking changes so that they change their data pipelines downstream. Then, if we want to understand more deeply what the data means, we can look at, for example, classification techniques to understand if we have PII data, for example, uh, to help us with GDPR compliance, or we can look at specific business keys by providing some custom rules to discover those business keys. This will help us integrate the data across different schema later on. Later on. And because Amazon Macy can do something like that for you in a serverless way, or based on your data volumes, you can use something like Data Brew to sample the data. Both those services provide their output as JSON, so we can uh, interpret this response and enrich our data catalog further to provide this additional information. Then, with data quality, we can look at some of the services that provide tests over the data. With AWS Glue data quality, you can describe that in a declarative way, and it natively integrates with your AWS Glue data catalog. Or you can use open source frameworks to run tests on the data, ship the logs to CloudWatch Log, use patterns to detect certain things that are not working well with your data, and later on enrich this information to your data catalog. Because the data catalog supports adding those arbitrary key value uh, uh, properties to your schemas and your columns. Finally, you can then segregate your data in PII and non-PII data. This way, you can simplify your access controls, but also governance. You can simply tell Macy no PII data should exist in non-PII pockets. All right, looking again at this picture, we see at one side, Sandra can use the abstracted ways to bring data inside the data platform, right? So it's an easy way for her to bring data in the data platform. On the other end, she gets those things from the data platform. She gets more enriched information about the data that's existing in the data platform, 
but she also gets notified if something broke with the data. I think this is a pretty good deal for Sandra. And if you agree with me, then maybe raise your hands. Yeah, it sounds like a good deal. I would take it too. All right, we're almost there, but Sandra says, I can see the data, but how can I query it? What would be the best way for me to use the data? This is now time that we provide her some other tools. And Stefan, can you help us? Of course. Uh, so yeah, what I'm going to do now is talk about uh, an ML flexible consumption. And I also would like to explain what we mean by that. Um, and we want to do it the following way. Um, I would like to introduce first a, a structure um, that um, helps us to organize the data that we have in our data platform. And uh, this is not yet a technical discussion. And then again, we will shift the perspective and we'll look at this structure through the eyes of our personas and their use cases and their way of working so we can identify what is the right tool for their job. So the general recommendation is to use a modern data layout when you have one domain in your data platform. And then if you have multiple domains in that same data platform, they should all follow the same structure. So the question now is, how does it look like? And let's get started. So the first layer is a staging layer that consists of the data landing zone that John has just introduced. And it also consists of a raw zone or a raw layer. And when we're creating raw data, what we do is we're uh, creating a one-to-one -one copy of data that we have in a specific source system, and we move it into our platform. When we create raw, um, we are not yet interested in the entity or the attribute level of the data, but we treat data really as a container. And maybe we ingest every day into our platform. And now this um, allows us to create like a history of data in our data platform, so we can then later on do time travel within the data. We will uh, also, uh, with raw data, what we do is we decouple from a specific data source, and that's also a great advantage. Um, when we build the first use case, we will move more data into the platform than we need for this specific use case. Why are we doing this? Well, this enables that we can implement new use cases relatively easily because the data is already there. And um, it also means that the storage that we use to store raw data needs to be very cost efficient. So raw is about moving data in the platform and make it available. And then we look at the base, and there we see consumables. And consumables are the complete opposite of raw data. Because here, we are only interested in the entity and in the attribute level that we need for a very specific use case. And we will store that in a, in a way that, uh, that it supports the use case as best as possible. Why are we doing this? Because we want to optimize the user experience for our personas. And we make a decision on the right granularity, on the right format, and we are also making a technology decision, use case by use case or category of use case. In one situation, we might decide to store the data in a data mart and put that in a cloud-based data warehouse. But in another situation, we maybe decide to, we want to store the data as a JSON document, put it into a key value store, so another system can then um, query that key value store and all the data would be available within a few milliseconds. Yeah, with um, raw and consumables, we could already start building our data platform, but it would mean that we need to reinvent the wheel every time we build a new use case, right? Because there would be no common concepts, no common formats, and things like how do we want to represent dates would not be defined. And that's the purpose of the integrated layer or the integration layer. So the purpose is to provide data in a trustworthy, in a normalized, in a cleansed, and in a harmonized way, so that's easy to use for um, downstream use cases. All right, so as I promised, now we want to switch the perspective, and we want to look at this structure through the eyes of our personas. And we start with Sandra, uh, our data scientist. And um, Sandra needs access to integrated uh, data, and that is also easy to use. That's why Sandra should work with data from the integrated layer. Um, she can also work with data from staging or from the raw layer, 
But this would mean that she would need to do the data cleaning, the data preparation completely on her own. Yeah, and then she needs um, ad hoc query capabilities because she wants to explore the data. And in order to do that, she can use Athena, which is an interactive query service that allows you to query files that are stored on a three using standard SQL. So Sandra can basically then fire SQL statements against the data in the integrated layer. Then later on, she maybe decides, okay, I want to do experiments, I want to build a predictive model. In order to do that, she can use um, SageMaker, which is a service to build um, and run machine learning models for any use case. Then we have Jim, our data engineer. And as I said, he's building those data-driven experiences for Buzz, right? So for example, he's, um, he's answering ad hoc questions that the business has. Um, and that's why he should also work with data from the integrated layer, because the data that he's working with is being used to drive strategic decisions. And that's why it needs to be harmonized and for, uh, also trustworthy. And to uh, perform those ad hoc queries, again, he can also use Athena. But then later on, um, for reoccurring questions, he might decide um, to provide self-service capabilities to our uh, people from business. And so he can use uh, Amazon QuickSight um, to build dashboards and reports that he provides to our business users. And then um, we have Buzz from business. He's consuming those dashboards that are provided uh, to, to him. But um, QuickSight has also generative BI capabilities and that enable Buzz to do um, changes on those provided dashboards. And for example, you can decide, I want to have a different point of view on the data, or I want to change some of the visuals. And uh, with uh, QuickSight Q, he can formulate those changes in natural language, and then the dashboards would be automatically uh, adapted. Or there's a senior executive maybe reaching out uh, to Buzz and asking, hey, I need a comprehensive report on our current sales situation, end of business, end of today, or maybe tomorrow. And then again, Buzz can use uh, QuickSight Q to create so-called narratives on dashboards, uh, and then QuickSight Q would create this um, yeah, summary and um, Buzz could also change that. As you see here, um, we are using Redshift to provide the data to QuickSight. Um, and Redshift is our cloud-based data warehouse. And we're using Redshift here to provide the data with very low latency to the dashboards and also um, so that Buzz um, can um, yeah, navigate very fast within the aggregated information. And, and so we're doing this only to optimize the user experience. And then last but not least, there's another player, smart applications. And these are all those systems that we have in our company who want to work and consume the insights that we generate in our data platform. And what's the best possible way to do that? Well, using an API. And you can build this API, an API gateway, and then behind the API, you have the freedom and the flexibility of all those over 200 services uh, that AWS provides. So for example, uh, I already said that um, we might decide we want to pre-aggregate some customer uh, information, like a customer 360, store it in a JSON document, and put that into DynamoDB, which is also a key value store. And then a downstream system could query that API and the key value store with very, very low latency. In another situation, uh, you might decide, oh, I need a customer search service. And for that, you need a full text index. And to, to implement that, you can use, for example, Amazon Open Search. And then you may decide to filter some of the search results uh, and reformat them. To do that, you can use Lambda. And then again, you would deliver the response over the API to the downstream system. Those use cases can be implemented relatively easily because the services are pre-integrated with each other. Back to you, John. All right. So you can see now how we can use multiple consumption patterns over the same data. But for consumption to be truly flexible, there is one more aspect that we need to consider, how to discover data. We discussed previously that with AWS Glue Data Catalog, um, Jim, and Sandra can use the technical metadata, uh, metadata catalog to discover the data. It also integrates with external metadata catalogs like Hive metadata stores, so it's really good for them. But as we want to share the data across multiple users, 
Now we can use AWS Lake Formation as a way to provide access and share data between different users, or maybe even between different domains. Data Zone, or Amazon Data Zone, would then come on top and provide this business discoverability, where now Buzz can build their business definition and terms on top of the data in order for the data to be more discoverable for business users. It's also pretty smart about it, so it provides uh, recommendations and summaries for those schemas as a readme automatically with Gen AI. Let's then talk about the next step. I don't need this. Yeah, so um, we almost solved all um, usability problems uh, with our data platform. But, you know, as we enable, uh, to, uh, enable the organization uh, to onboard data more easily, what happens is more data will flow into our platform, right? So how can we make sure um, that um, yeah, Buzz and Sandra, for example, are looking at the same data, at the same tables, at the same column, at the same entities? And more importantly, how can we make sure that they also interpret it in the same way? And you might think um, this only applies to financial reporting, but um, well, as you know, use cases show that's not really true. For example, one of our customers lately had issues um, in their packaging and in their fulfillment centers because um, the package sizes um, th that they you know, wanted to send out sometimes did not fit with the goods that they want to send out. And that created a lot of friction in the the processing and in the packaging process. And as the teams tried to figure out the, the root cause of that issue, they found out that different services in their platform use different size conversion rates, and yeah, that created um, the friction here. So the problem was not that data was not available, but the problem was more that different services, different people had different interpretation about the data. So uh, what can we do about that? Well. Data lineage um, yeah, is one way to tackle that, and it allows you to trace uh, the data flow from your sources over your various analytical services in your platform down to the consumer. And it comes also hand in, um, in handy um, to provide um, auditability and also to make sure that you process data in line with your company policies, but also with regulatory requirements. Yeah, and in the end, we can make sure that Sandra and Buzz are really looking at the same data when they work with it. Now, when you combine data lineage that you track uh, with um, data quality information that you also track within your platform, then you can come into a state where you can make a sound um, statement about, for example, the health of a model, but also the health of a dashboard that you provide to your users. And I think that's an interesting capability that your data platform can have. So the question is, how do we implement that? In order to capture data lineage consistently in your platform, you need to use a common lineage model. One way to do that is um, the open source project, Open Lineage, which um, provides a technology agnostic lineage model. And the good thing about Open Lineage is it's also integrating well with many analytical services, for example, with Apache Airflow, and you can run Airflow and Open Lineage conveniently in uh, Amazon Managed Workflows for Apache Airflow, the tongue breaker service of our session. Um, if you then want to display lineage information, you can use another open source project with the name Maquet, and it's also in, um, they're supporting the Open Lineage uh, meta model or the Open Lineage standard. And you can run Maquet as a container either on Fargate uh, in ECS or also on Kubernetes if you want. Um, if you're interested in this architecture, we also um, created a blog post about it, and we have an AWS Quick Start available, so you can easily um, try it out in your AWS account. All right. We are solving a lot of problems for our gyms, Sandras, and the smart application users out there, right? But there's still one more step. Sandra has a question about how do I deliver actionable outcome from the analysis that I'm doing? Well, I know right now that from the business information or the business events, that certain orders are not bundled well, but which customers are using that? 
this is a trigger then to go to the next step. How a differentiating use case would bring us to bring the data from different domains. Now, we have some model to explain how you can in choose the right data architecture for your data platform. However, just in the interest of time, we're going to assume that we're going to use a distributed pattern to show how we can integrate data across different domains. Let's look at our two of uh, two data products described uh, in our data platform. We mentioned that we would love people to use the same layout. And if you look at the data, the structure of those data platforms, now it makes sense how those data platforms would integrate, right? Because since we are confident somehow about the quality and the format of the data in the integrated layer, we can just federate integration across those layers, maybe with something like AWS-like formation, to access the data across those two different layers, since they are in the same technical data platform. But what happens if the data is also uh, maintained by a different platform? Maybe the CRM system is holding our customer data, and it has its own data lake. Well, we can use the same lay layout again to our advantage because we can bring the consumable data from those consumable layers to the raw data. Or if we are confident about the data quality, we can bring it directly to the integrated layer. Well, now Sandra has some kind of a happy ending. She now knows exactly which type of customers are being affected by those orders that are not shipped well. And she can now tell Buzz or Jim to build some kind of a differentiating product that would provide better predictions or maybe acknowledge the problems that happened in the past. Because just an acknowledgement or a goodie in your package can go a long way in preventing customer churn. All right, Stefan. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad that my mic. Okay. Yeah, I'm glad that uh, our story has a happy ending, and uh, I would like to uh, wrap up our session today. And I, I would like to give you two takeaways. Uh, at least that those are my two most important takeaways from the session. And the first one is um, a data platform is not a data strategy. And in order to build or create a successful data strategy, you need to think and you need to address uh, all these three pillars here, mindset, people and process, and then also technology. And the second takeaway is this um, evolutionary architecture that we showed you today. And um, don't directly jump into scaled approaches um, because the first thing that you should do is really think about how can you remove adoption barriers for your users and your personas and then as a second step how can you enable flexible consumption and then later on as John said if you need it think about scaled patterns. Yeah, and we are also present at the um, data strategy booth here in the summit so if you want to uh, continue the discussion with us feel free to come by. Also behind the QR code, there's a, I would say, comprehensive website with a lot of resources that we put together, um, including the blog post that I mentioned, so feel free to check it out. All right. We would like to thank you all for hanging over with us and staying all this way. We are data-driven, so please provide us your feedback. We read every comment, so let us know if there is any other topics that you want to discuss about your data platform or data in general. We're going to look at those comments. With that, I'd like to thank you all and enjoy the rest of the summit.